do you think that you have freedom of the press? Have you ever encountered situations where you've been censored or you've been told, shh, too much, too much. We're not ready for this. All the, what? <laughs> All the time. And I'm bullied a lot. Really? Online. Yes, because some of the topics I talk about are, in quote, controversial mm-hmm. or challenging certain societal norms mm-hmm. that have been existent for centuries. And, you know, when you're challenging norms that men love, and um, we live in a patriarchal society where when the power is imbalanced... Mm-hmm. Um, the people who have been taking advantage or the people who have been benefiting from that power structure would fight back. So I do get a lot of bullying from men specifically. Uh, uh. Um, <laughs> I've lost some jobs. What? Uh, yes, you know, there was a time, this is a very funny story. This was back in Nigeria. I'm Nigerian, yes. We were, we were going to establish that next because guys are like, what accent is this? Is she from it's Moranga? Where is she from? <laughs> um, so I remember when I was in Nigeria and I was working in this meeting Media house and they wanted me to go I think interview some people in this high level stakeholder meeting mm-hmm. and um, when they did my research about who's this person coming to interview this high level people they saw that I did a lot of issues around sexuality reproductive rights and they said no they can't have me come Mm-mm. and interview them yeah because some of the things that I spoke about were in quote vulgar mm. so I do know that in the space that I'm in I'm going to lose out on a lot of you know uh, opportunities just because of the kind of conversations that I talk about and also the level of depth that I would like to take these conversations conversations to, to. Yeah. okay hey. it is world freedom uh, of the press day and you've you've suffered some bullying online mm-hmm. and I just keep thinking I mean it's 2023 why why is this still the case do you think it's because we aren't talking to both sides of the of the divide meaning the the parents or the older generation as well as the kids and so when you say i'm going to teach children about sexual reproductive rights uh, health um and everything that comes in that realm the parents automatically feel some kind of way would it help to speak to them first you know, it's a very cultural and religious thing. Mm. So it's not just parents, even normal citizens, yes. uh, your elder brother, your younger sisters. Mm-hmm. But you've, if you've grown up in an African society where issues around sex are shrouded in secrecy, mm. someone trying to discuss this in a public forum and doing it so openly can ruffle some feathers. So I think it's conditioning. We definitely, um, even when I go to talk to schools or whatever, I have to get permission from the principals. Mm-hmm. I have to get permission from this from the parents as well. And sometimes the teachers actually stay in the classes just for the beginning after a while we let them go but just to make them feel comfortable that the discussions that we're having are not things that are erotic mm. i feel like parents are always scared that we're going to be talking to them about the nitty-gritty mm-hmm. but we're actually talking about other thematic areas that surround one's sexuality and relationships that actually are the driving force for either w- whether we get into abusive or unhealthy relationships because if you don't know what consent is if you don't have the ability to be assertive and say no when you mean no mm-hmm. it's very easy for you to find yourself in those kind of uh, situations. So for parents or for people, other Africans who are just very um, scared, mm. because even if they do want to talk about this, they know that we're having a lot of you know violence and the increase of rape and all of that. They know this, mm. but they just don't know where to start this from. You need to recognize that we're living in the 21st century, that your teenagers and your kids can find this information online, and True. you want to make sure that they are not having access to the wrong information that would ruin their sexual template from when they're kids. Mm. So it's good to have informed accurate scientific information around one's sexuality and autonomy so what is one study to be like what did you tell your parents i want to go and teach people what what did you say to your (laughs) folks when you went to uni um okay so what you can do anything if you want to become this still yeah i'm sure you can have your specialty but what i studied is my my first degree is in public health sciences Mm -hmm. first you hear that (laughs) can fast Mm-hmm. Let public, know. public, yeah, it's important. <laughs> when we say jam master, we don't mean we pick people off the street. We say they are masters of their craft. So first, eh, first degree is. So my first degree is uh, public health sciences, and yeah. then my second degree is in HIV and health management. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So because I have a background in public health and HIV, most of my project, my research, were focused on sexual, um, sexual reproductive health yes. around teenagers and women, and. Uh, just also going through a personal journey of unlearning and relearning one's you know, sexual agency and autonomy. Mm. I decided to start going to schools to talk about relationship first, actually. Just what is healthy, what's unhealthy relationships. Yes. And when you start having this conversation, you recognize that the teenagers you're talking to don't even know anything about their body. Mm. So I began to expand the uh, curriculum as I you know, pers- went to different schools as well. So that was just really how it started. Okay. Yeah. It's called the eldest daughter syndrome, okay? Uh, and from what 
that I uh, have read up on it. It's basically when the emotional burden is is born by the eldest daughters in a lot of our families from a very young age. You are taking care of your younger siblings. You're helping out with uh, everyday chores. You're the one cooking. You're the one who can use a knife. So you're the one chopping onions uh, to make sure everybody has dinner. You're probably up before everybody else. Um, so now here's what I find interesting about this conversation and the reason I think it's relevant for today is because these young kids that we're speaking about have access to TikTok whether uh, it's their own account or their friends or their siblings they're looking at what's happening and they've probably already seen this thing so I'm imagining a scenario where a mom is told excuse me um, this is abuse because uh, TikTok said so and how do we how do we have this conversation in this context so that we're saying empower our children who have access to so much it's almost like an overload of information on these social media platforms so that even a topic like this that an African society would say but that's normal we all went I'm sure we all went I definitely went through that mm-hmm. um, I, I'd say that I partially raised my my younger sister and disciplined her in equal measure what, what do you think about that um hmm oh. <laughs> it's that any conversation that starts with oh. <laughs> It means it's it, it, it means it the same in Kenya, my dear. That, hmm, it's the same. <laughs> what are your uh, thoughts, Jamaskalolo? Um, Lolo? <laughs> truly, truly, I I love social media. Yes. I I love the I love it as a tool for connecting people. Mm-hmm. I recognize that in Africa, there are certain things that have been normalized for centuries, like mm-hmm. the eldest daughter syndrome. Yes. It's basically your bet right yeah. as the first daughter. Yes. You, this is literally what you're meant to do. But when you Find a platform like TikTok that just makes the world look smaller because you in your one little room in, you know, Kenya CBD can be watching one girl in Los Angeles, you know, going through very similar issues that you might have been feeling very uncomfortable about for a very long time. But since everyone around you is doing the same thing, you have no way to actually complain because everyone is doing the same thing. And when you see another lady in LA who is going through similar things and coming out and talking about it and saying, look, I was the first daughter and because of this, I felt like mm. I have been a parent all my life. Mm-hmm. I lost my childhood. I lost the ability to be carefree, to make mistakes because you have to literally, you know, take care of your younger ones. And yes. the fact that I'm an adult now, you know, I'm hyper independent. You know, there's so many things that we that manifest as adults that we don't even know mm. that the root of those issues is because of the way we were raised as kids. So I really like what that platform is doing in terms of bringing up this conversation around, you know, eldest daughter syndrome. Mm. I'm the first child. I'm the first daughter. I know what that is and um, I've seen it manifest in so many women that I know so many friends of mine and um, I like the conversation I do feel though what mm-hmm. you said about you know the Africans the teenage girl 14 is going to be on TikTok you know mm-hmm. watching that video and she comes home and tells her mom like mom like mm. <laughs> I'm tired. I, I have rights. And the I, mom says, like, what? where? In whose house? In my home. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I know. But I really, you know what? I like to challenge like the older generation. In mm-hmm. quote, like what's that? We're all getting old anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do like to challenge the older generation that is used to a certain way of living. Sometimes you forget the hardship that you went through during that age. Because as you get older, you start to face new struggles. So you really repeat the same mistakes the things that you really you did not want to have to take care of all your kids siblings at that time mm. but now that you've gotten older, that it's easier for you to romanticize those you know moments and say oh it made me stronger it made me independent it allowed me to know how to like you know take care of kids but at what expense what did you lose to be mm. able to gain those traits so um it's a very nuanced conversation yeah but it's also why i like like you know platforms like this where we see a lot of young people talking about the things that they're going through because when i went through the the hashtag I was waiting to see one African lady that yeah. my age. No, all white kids. I was yes. like, what are you yeah. even going through that you... Child, did you fetch water from the well? Dude, no. Yeah. <laughs> you went to the tap. Listen. It, it, you're very right. The context, I think, is important to clarify. Because, to be honest, <laughs> I think the other thing that probably was happening in the West is that you'll do this and you'll get... It's called babysitting, mm-hmm, okay? Mm-hmm. And you'll get a little pocket money for babysitting that is outside here in Africa. It's like your birthright, as you said. Um, and I think that gives a very different perspective so it, you could argue that the parents were teaching them how to earn you know and the mm-hmm. value of money mm-hmm. whereas here it's just expected because your parents have to
to go out and work mm-hmm. and provide for the family and so everybody does their part so yeah. if a family unit is considered to be uh, everybody's an equal player mm-hmm. and an equal participant and an equal contributor to the level that they are capable of doing yeah. it's the way your mom says okay help me set the table and everybody knows they've got the older one carries the plates because if the younger one carries they'll break you yeah. know it's everybody has a role to play everyone is chipping in i wonder if this then makes um these young adolescent girls feel well okay if you're treating me as an adult at a younger age then i can behave like an adult that's <laughs> a very interesting question actually i i feel like we live in a society where girls have been told that they're more mature than their boys the girls are also given more chores to do so yes. when we won't talk about you know everyone supporting we know that the girls do more mm-hmm. you know homework than the than their counterparts um but they're also not given the privilege and mm. the opportunity to make mistakes mm. so even the idea that because i have been treated like an adult in terms of you know taking care of kids i can also continue to act like an adult in other parts of my life no. mm. Mm. so it's very confusing this is taking us you know to another conversation but this is why it's very confusing for adolescent girls because when it comes to taking responsibilities when it comes to taking care of the home and taking the punishment i'm treated like an adult yes but when it's time for me to make decisions about my own life you're treated like a child. You're, they, they remind you mm. that you're a child. <laughs> so you're in that mm. push and pull where you're really not giving full autonomy except someone is taking advantage of your skill set or of your presence there. So it's a very interesting um, dialogue uh, mm. that we, we're talking about. And actually when you talk about here in African family where I hear you where everyone chip in, do the best that you can because it's, we just have a different dynamic. Poverty is a thing here. Mm-hmm. My mother has to go make money, which means that I'm the first child. I have to step up, you know, to do that. But we live in Africa where most times we know that those responsibilities fall on the girls. Mm. So even if the first child is a boy, his life is different from yeah. the child, True. from the life of a first daughter. Mm. The so eldest son syndrome is, is very different. Listen, yeah. that one's enjoyment. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoyment syndrome. <laughs> Very quickly, if you could speak to the parent who's listening now okay. um, and the young adolescent, because I think we've got a, a range of, of listeners across the, the globe. Um, from your experience, what would you say has been your most um, memorable learning? Hmm. Okay, so two questions. Mm-hmm. Um, if I could talk to the older generation, yes. a parent listening, an educator, principal listening, is to recognize that you live in the 21st century. A lot of things have changed. Mm. Even if you don't want them to, a lot of things have changed. Um, your teenagers, your kids, they have access to more information in ways that are s- so easy. It's literally at the you know the tip of your fingertips. So mm. um, recognize the reality that you live in and empower yourself with knowledge. Do that research. If you're scared for a stranger to come teach them then do the research on your own read up on it so that you can uh, be a safe space for the teenagers and for the children that you work with i like that be a safe space yeah okay and for the young youngins for the young girls the, girls the ones here with me and the ones listening in the one thing i would say is um hmm. Before you engage in any sexual encounter, make sure that you are sexually aware and sexually Mm. empowered with the right information. Mm. What that means that you have the ability to recognize the consequences of the action that you're about to partake in. Until you've gotten to that moment where you recognize the consequences of your actions, I would advise that you refrain Mm. your sexual debut and just take more time to learn about yourself, to read more information. Because the more empowered you are with knowledge, the easier it is for you, uh, the the, the more pleasurable it is for you whenever you decide to engage in that because you'll be doing it um, wholeheartedly because it's something you really want. Okay. Yeah.